delighted to welcome as our guest today, uh, Dr. Derek Thomas. Dr. Thomas serves as professor of systematic and historical theology at Reformed Theological Seminary in Atlanta. And he's also a minister of preaching and teaching at First Presbyterian Church of Columbia, South Carolina. He's written numerous volumes, including a particularly influential one on suffering and Job. And uh, we're delighted to welcome him today. So thank you, Dr. Thomas. Thank you. It's my privilege uh, not just to be with you, Jonathan, but to be here at uh, Cairn University. Well, we're, we're glad to have you. I, I wonder if we could start by uh, you telling us a little bit about your uh, conversion. How was it that you were brought to faith in Christ? I have a, a Saul of Tarsus uh, story uh, in that um, I wasn't uh, raised in a Christian home, uh, didn't, didn't attend church at all, except very briefly when I was about 13 for a few months, uh, and then decided Christianity, or at least church, wasn't for me. Uh, grew up in a fairly dysfunctional family in Wales uh, in the 60s, and uh, my interest uh, was math and physics, and uh, went off to university. Uh, to study, uh, first of all, physics, and ended up doing a major in math. And uh, in the Christmas of 1971, uh, this is my sophomore year at uh, university, uh, my best friend, uh, we were both obsessed with classical music, um, my best friend sent me in the mail, he'd, he'd gone to study physics at a different university, uh, he sent me John Stott's Basic Christianity. I, it was the first Christian book I'd ever seen. Uh, I didn't possess a Bible, so uh, I, it, it was a little note inside, I'd become a Christian, uh, I'd love you to read this. So he had just come to faith. Correct. And uh, I think if anybody else had sent me this book, to be honest, I probably wouldn't have read it, but, but because he was my best friend, I actually did read it. And uh, within two days, I'd gone from, you know, not believing in hell to, to thinking if I died, I was, I was heading there. Uh, I still didn't have a Bible. Until, you know, the only Bible I read was whatever John Stott quoted, which he did a great deal in this book. Uh, and uh, it was about 11, 15 or so, uh, December the 28th, uh, 1971. I, uh, I just got on my knees and, and asked the Lord, uh, I think I would have said then, into my heart. And... Uh, uh, knew immediately as soon as I got up, I just I just knew immediately I I was saved, and I couldn't have articulated it theologically. Uh, it was it was purely on an emotional level at that point. And then over the next uh, few days and weeks, uh, tried to come to terms with what exactly had happened. Uh, my mother called for the doctor in, in a day when the doctor came to your home, and he prescribed uh, tranquilizers because he thought I was having some kind of breakdown, uh, which I, did, I didn't take, but um, I, I'd kept my mother up you know, most of the night trying to, trying to convert her, and uh, she thought I was just going completely crazy. And, um, and then went to church that Sunday. Um, the minister was uh, liberal, a nice man. I mean, I knew him socially. Um, I, I told him after church, first, this is the first service I'd ever been at, I told him at the door of the church that I'd been, I'd been saved. And he said, uh, no, you haven't. He said, come and see me tomorrow. So, you know, I went to see him at the manse, and uh, we had um, tea and biscuits and cookies, and uh, talked about, you know, sport and politics and, uh, you know, life generally, but not about Christianity. And then as I was leaving, he, he gave me uh, Paul Tillich's The Shaking of the Foundations, and said, too much religion is a bad thing, he said to this me. This is what the minister this said. This is what the minister said. And I thought, you know, I, I, had no, I had no means of discerning liberal, conservative, you know, I just, I just at that point I thought, well, you know, all ministers are, are Christians, right? Uh, surely. Um, so I was just really confused, read Paul Tillich's book, uh, actually reread it as a seminary student later and realized that what he had done was was satanic. It was trying to undermine and undo my faith. Mm -hmm. That's all the point of this was. Uh, 
I read it and I didn't understand it, to be honest. It was like a veil was, was pulled over my eyes. Uh, I gave it back to him the following week and then I went back to college. And when I went back to college, I, I saw this uh, advertisement on the, on the wall, which had been there before, but I hadn't really paid much attention to it. And it, it was for the, what I called the God Squad, namely the InterVarsity Fellowship Christian Union. Mm -hmm. And they met uh, in the Students' Union building on a Saturday night. And, you know, they were kind of, you know, in, in the stereotype, they were, they were the God Squad. So I went along and, um, you know, I, I, I saw some people that I actually knew from class and realized, oh, okay, so these people are actually Christians. And, uh, I, you know, they were stunned to see me there, and I, I said I'd been... I'd been saved over the vacation, and uh, so they said, where are you going to go to church? And, and this was an important question because my experience of church so far right. had not been good. And I said, um, I was thinking of going to you know, church X, and they said, oh, no, 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 you don't, you don't need to be going there. We'll pick you up in the morning, and uh, you can come with us. And, and I ended up attending a church uh, where the minister was a graduate of Westminster Seminary. Hmm. Jeff Thomas, and he's, he's still oh, the he minister was... to this day. Oh, okay. Uh, and that developed a, a, you know, a lifetime's friendship and relationship with uh, Jeff Thomas. But, um, but you managed to avoid becoming a Baptist, even. Well, even actually, I, the... I did not. I became a Baptist by default, really, and, um, and then uh, became a pedo Baptist while I was at seminary, but that, that's another story. Uh, but no, I, I was actually baptized as a and immersed as a believer um, in, in Jeff in Thomas's church, Jeff Thomas's church uh, in 1970, probably in, in spring of 1972, and uh, and then was actually elected a deacon in the church later. Hmm. And um, I think my 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 picture still hangs on the wall of the church. I'm told, and uh, it's been a few years since I was there. Uh, but that was my initial experience, and then. Uh, when I went to the Christian Union, uh, you know, I discover the Christian Union is studying a series of, of uh, addresses on uh, the communicable and incommunicable attributes of God. Mm -hmm. That's almost unthinkable that a Christian Union would be doing that. Right. It, it was it was very reformed. Uh, it was uh, they were bringing in lots of local and not so local ministers and, and going through God's attributes. So I was introduced to uh, Jim Packer's Knowing God mm -hmm. within, within a month or two months of being converted. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, I, was kind of, I was sort of hooked by it completely and utterly, uh, by the depth of it, by the, the careful analysis of it, by the argumentation of it. Um, and then, then met Jim Packer, uh, who came and spoke at the Christian Union um, a year, maybe two years later, and uh, almost went to study uh, at Trinity College, where he was uh, mm -hmm. where he was teaching at the time, and did go for a weekend and was interviewed by him. And uh, I was still I was still dabbling with Anglicanism, only because my mother was an Anglican, although she never went to church. But you know, I just had this. Should I should I be an Anglican? Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, so I, I I don't know whether Jim Packer would remember this today, but um, probably not. Uh, but um, uh, he, he's actually in my hometown this weekend, and I, I had in, been invited to a, a lunch with him, which I which I couldn't do. And I was going to remind him of the story that uh, I went into his office, and I, and he said he asked me about uh, you know my future. Um, in ministry, because by this time I was thinking about the ministry, and I said, well, I was thinking about the Anglican Church, and, and he said, why in the world would you do that? <laughs> he said, it's, it's one thing for me because I'm in the Anglican Church, but why would you want to enter the Anglican Church? And he, he said, what church are you going to? And I said, Alfred Place Baptist yeah. Church, where Jeff Thomas... He said, well, stay there. <laughs> I mean, he was quite adamant about right. it. And uh, I, I like to remind people of that story. That he I wish talked I'd, you out of... Yeah, I wish I'd recorded it, but... Uh, well, now, now how, how did that work? How did you move from, you're a new Christian, you're reading Knowing God, you're involved in the, in the uh, student union and also, uh, and also at the church, and then, and then how did the Lord work in your life to bring you to the point of saying, I, I think that I'm called to the ministry? I, 
I, this is how I experienced it in a, in a biographical way, but this is how I would argue it from a theological and biblical way too. And I think it, it is a combination both of gifting and uh, inclination uh, and, and providence. And, and all three of those came together for me. I, I, for a reason that I cannot explain to you, but from, from the moment I was converted, certainly within within a few months of being converted, I had this overwhelming desire to be a minister. I, so it was very soon? Very soon, within, within a couple of months of being converted. And I, you know, my only view of ministry was a very classic one. I, I knew virtually nothing about it. it. It certainly didn't have the variety that ministry today would, mm -hmm. would bring to mind. Mm -hmm. For me, entering the ministry meant becoming a minister. And... Um, uh, the church, I mentioned this, well, I was, I was elected to be the president of the Christian Union. Within, within two years, I was president mm -hmm. of the Christian Union. And the speed and growth with which that happened indicated now in hindsight, objectively in hindsight, indicated a, a, an awareness on the part, certainly, of some that I possessed certain abilities or gifts mm -hmm for this kind of ministry. And then uh, I was a member of the local church, and um, uh, I think the turning point, the real turning point was, uh, Jeff Thomas said to me one, one uh, day, uh, he was supposed to preach, and, and this was an entire setup I learned afterwards, but he was supposed to preach at this little country church in the afternoon, and he, he had another engagement, which was, I think, a daughter's birthday. Uh, I discovered afterwards, uh, but he, he was setting me up, uh, and he said, I want, I want you to go and preach for me, and this was my first sermon, and I drove out there, and uh, um, there were three people, one of whom was the organist who was behind me, so there were two people uh, in front of me, and, you know, I, I preached my heart out, and it was probably a dreadful sermon. <laughs> I, I, I have very little memory of it, except... I can see the occasion in my head, but I don't, I don't rem remember the text or anything that I said. I remember some early texts after that. And, um, and uh, that sort of confirmed for me, I, however dreadful it probably was, I enjoyed it. Mm -hmm. And it was a country church where the two people in front of me were fairly elderly, and, and I was, you know, I was... 19 maybe mm -hmm. so in their eyes you know i was being encouraged to think of the universe and beyond to go where mm -hmm. no man has gone mm -hmm. before mm -hmm. as as these sweet little ladies often do and uh, and you sort of believe them at the time um but it was it was it was an important factor in a in perceiving gifting but also perceiving how gifting and inclination coalesce, and it's what I wanted to do more than anything else. So, you know, I went straight into the ministry. I, you know, I had a few odd jobs here and there, but I, I, didn't, I didn't do the, you know, you've got to work in the world for 10 years before you mm -hmm. think of the ministry. I, I didn't do that. I went straight from, from university to seminary and straight from seminary, almost straight from seminary into the ministry. And um, I, I know there are differences of opinion about that, but that was, that was my story. Well, I'd imagine now you're, you're asked by people in similar situations to the one you were in, what should I do? And, and do, do you, how do you advise them? I mean, do you say to them, uh, if you can, you should go, go straight into seminary, or, or, or do you take it on a case-by-case -case basis? Do you talk about internal and external call? You sort of framed your own situation that way. Sure, and, and, you know, there are two sort of extremes, uh, and I talk about the clowny end and the Spurgeon end. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Spurgeon says, if, if you can do anything else, do it. Uh, you, you've got to have this overwhelming, empowering, uh, providential, um, uh, I don't know what you call it, uh, I mean, oomph, mm -hmm. that, 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 that impels you. Mm -hmm. and, if, but, and if you can resist that, then you should, then you should right. go somewhere else. Right. I, I don't think that's a balanced view. Um, Clowney's wonderful little book uh, called To the Ministry, or 
I think it's called, and uh, been very influential. You know, and I read Clowney, and I almost hear Clowney saying, you know, if, if you have the gifts, then you should be in the ministry. Mm -hmm. And that's it, whether you have a call or not, a sense of call or not. Mm -hmm. And I, I would think it would be very difficult to survive in pastoral ministry without some corroborating experiential dimension that I, I feel a, you know, I do feel a sense of call. This is where I should be. Now, that, that calling for me initially was, was purely on an emotional or an affectional area somewhere. I, I, think, I think it was a work of the Spirit, for sure, but, but um, it wasn't tried or tested. And I think that both of these things are necessary. Right. And I would say, I, I, as I do say to seminary students who ask me about this all the time, uh, you know, I, I, do think, I do think that having some sense of call. Is this what you really want to do? Uh, is this what you really think God is calling you to do? And I think if you don't have that, the ministry is going to be a tough place to be. Well, I would also think that you could make the argument a little differently as well and say it'd be tough to survive with just that internal sense because we'll always look inside and say, did I really, you know, right, think that's through? Right, but that takes care of itself because if you can't preach your way out of, out of a paper bag, right. you know, folk will tell you that right, right, in short right. order, and right. you will find yourself having to consider something else. So that's why I say to students, you know, it is important while you're studying for ministry to actually use whatever gifts you think you have or whatever gifts people have told you that you have and, and let them be tested. You know, so find opportunities to lead a Bible study or or, or do a talk, you mm -hmm. know, call, or, or if possible, even to, to preach a sermon mm -hmm. somewhere, somehow. And, uh, and I've asked students in the past, you know, record it for me and, and, and I'll listen to it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, may, they may not be the best sermons you've ever heard, although, although I, I do find today's students much more self-assured than, than my generation was. But that's another factor in, in the works. But... But I, I, think, um, I think having an objective assessment, yes, I see potential gifts here, gifts that need to be sharpened and honed and uh, developed for sure, but I see, I see, I see certain gifts here that, that the church needs and could, could use, and I, I think you should be encouraged to use your life in, in this way. And then trust Providence to open and close doors. What about the place of theological training? Obviously, it's something you've invested a great deal of your own life in. You, if you find students who are, or maybe not students, if you find people who are, who are gifted in these ways, they have a desire, you know, so all these things seem to be fitting together. Uh, what, what do you, how do you persuade them? How do you sort of make the case that you have both those things, but it's really worthwhile for you to receive some training and education? Um, you know, I'm in a tradition, and de um, a denominational tradition, uh, in which there is no choice. Mm -hmm. If you want to be a minister in, in my denomination, you have to have a seminary degree. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's, there's, there's no choice about it. Uh, generally, I would say, you know, only if you're a Spurgeon or mm -hmm. a Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones, mm -hmm. you know, should you, should you even consider not going to seminary. And, and you're not. And you are not. <laughs> uh, trust me, you are not. And, um, you know, so there are these exceptions out there. My heart is torn, you know, when I see, and I do see, you know, 55-year-olds coming right. to seminary. And, and, you know, they're going to be three, four, sometimes five years and they're going to be 58, 59, 60 before they begin ministry. And, and they're content with that, and that's fine. You know, without seminary education, however that education is delivered, and, and there are many ways to deliver seminary education. And, uh, you know, there's an accredited way, and then there's a non-accredited way. And in an ideal world, you know, is seminary education, the way we do it, is that the best way of delivering education for ministry? And the answer is probably no. Uh, but uh, it, you know, we, we, don't, we don't live in an ideal world, right. and uh, there, there, is, there, is a, there are basic things that you need to know and need to understand before you can be trusted to be a, um, an expounder of Scripture and somebody who, who deals with people's hearts and souls. And, um, you know, a basic competence in Scripture in 
biblical and systematic theology, in worldview, uh, in biblical languages, and in history. If, unless you, unless you mm -hmm. want to be the guy who repeats the errors mm -hmm. of history, you need to know some history. And uh, so, you know, you can argue for the basic curriculum of seminary education. And, um, yeah, there are problems with seminary education in 2013, where we are, uh, not least the cost of it. Mm -hmm. uh, it is a postgraduate degree, uh, um, by which time a lot of students are married, committed with children. Uh, it's getting increasingly more difficult to become a full-time student. Mm -hmm. um, because of the cost of it. So, yeah, there are lots of problems. Right. Uh, and I, I do, I do I find myself having to deal with some of those problems as to how long it's now taking for people to get into uh, full-time uh, ministry. But in your own case, you, uh, by the time you were ready to enter seminary, uh, you, you did. And, uh, and then what were your first uh, church experiences after graduation from seminary? Uh, too, too long a story, but I ended up uh, studying at Reformed Seminary, where yep. I now teach yep. uh, in, in Jackson. We, uh, I married the only girl I've ever dated in my life, um, and the only girl I ever kissed, uh, which I did on the day I married her, which puts me in the ark, <laughs> uh, for sure. Uh, but uh, we got married, and two weeks later, we were in Jackson, Mississippi, and, and there was a culture shock and a life-changing uh, episode in my life from 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 marriage to Mississippi mm -hmm. was an enormous uh, change. Uh, came back. Well, I became Pedro Baptist in the final semester uh, at seminary. I I was sort of wrestling with the issue, wondering, you know, was I a committed uh, Reformed Baptist? And um, and I was. I was a sort of card carrying proselyte, David Kingdon's Children of Abraham. Paul Jewett's work mm -hmm. that lay mm -hmm. behind that, mm -hmm. um, and, and that's where I was. And then I did an elective on, and, and the only requirement of this elective was, uh, director's study, was um, to write a paper on why I am a Reformed Baptist, mm -hmm. which I did, and argued the case as well as I could, and then realized after I'd finished and, and got an A in the course, and and then uh, the professor said, who was a dear friend later, a professor said to me, now, are you really convinced? And I said, no, not really. <laughs> and it all sort of fell apart. Right. And uh, it was like a house of cards that I had built, and it all came tumbling down. And it was more of a gestalt. Uh, it was more of a perspective than, say, you know, I'd never seen this text or that text before. Uh, it, was, it was a way of putting the pieces together. Mm -hmm. And so uh, that, that put a major spanner in the works, um, went back to Britain. Uh, the Baptist, for some reason, didn't want me anymore, and the Pedro Baptist didn't know who I was. So I ended up uh, teaching. I was, I was married. I lived with my in-laws for three months, and, and that couldn't last. Uh, I remember my father-in-law having a, a very straight talk with me over breakfast one morning. You know, I, I now have two degrees but no job, and I'm married to his daughter and living in his house. And he said, son, it's time for you to get a job. And he was right, of course. So, <laughs> so that day, uh, I, saw, I saw a job for teaching math in mm -hmm. high school in the paper. Called him up and, and went for an interview on the Monday morning and got the job, uh, so, uh, which started uh, the following week. Mm -hmm. So uh, taught high school math for um, about eight months or so, uh, I would be anything, uh, a, a Walmart people greeter before I would be a high school math teacher again. Uh, it was a dreadful experience. And, um, and then uh, I wrote a letter to um, a church in Belfast uh, where the minister was W.J. Greer, mm -hmm. uh, who was a well-known name, uh, spoke at Banner Conference, Banner Truth Conference every year. Studied at Princeton Seminary, was a friend of Gresham Machen. Mm -hmm. and I wrote to him and I said, were there any opportunities? And he replied instantly by mail, this was before email, of course, by mail and said, yes, uh, he was looking for an assistant. So I went over for an interview, got the job, and uh, I moved there. Uh, my, my daughter was born 
uh, three weeks before, and we, we moved to Belfast. I became his assistant, and then about two months after that, he retired. He'd been in the church for 52 years. Did he years. know this when he wrote no, you the letter? No, he, he was actually on the verge of Alzheimer's, and maybe not so much on the verge of it, and, uh, but the church certainly knew it. And then they did what, what is always difficult to do. They, they called the assistant to be the, the, the solo minister, the senior minister, and uh, I was 25. They'd, they had only ever had Mr. Greer since 1932 or something like that. And so they'd had him for over 50 years and more. And then, and then and he's now in his mid 70s and he retires and then they have a 25 year old. Uh, who really, I mean, I had, I had some preaching experience, uh, for sure, but uh, not that much. And uh, so I went straight into solo ministry uh, in, a, in an established, traditional, uh, Presbyterian, Reformed, smallish denomination, uh, the Evangelical Presbyterian Church of mm -hmm. Ireland, and uh, was there for 18 years. It was, was absolutely wonderful. Um, uh, you know, it, it, they were they were different times for sure, and um, uh, I learnt I learnt from godly elders. Uh, it convinced me of of the wisdom of eldership. Uh, I had four uh, elders, and uh, and they were old enough to be my parents, and and a couple of them old enough to be my grandparents. And um, I had never read uh, Robert's Rules of Order. In fact, it's one of my goals to reach, read reach the grave having never read it. Why would you need to read it when there are experts all around you who can tell you what it says? And um, so I didn't really know how to lead a meeting. And after the first session meeting, uh, one of the elders, a uh, dear, dear man, pulled me aside. I, I mean, I'd committed horrendous issues in this meeting <laughs> by not following rules. And he pulled me aside and he said, look, I'm going to give you four or five little, little rules, he says. And if you follow these four or five rules, you'll be fine. And he went through them and uh, I wrote them down and, and uh, rehearsed them with him and, and that was it. And, uh, you know, I, I, was, I, was, um, I was never in a church where, where they said to me, you know, your predecessor would have done it this way. Mm -hmm. or, uh, they were just very encouraging. But it was a very traditional church with a very traditional expectation of pastoral ministry, including, you know, a fairly intense program of visitation. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, I did everything. So there were three sermons a week. Two on Sunday, one on one midweek, and uh, um, you know, like like a lot of small churches or smaller churches, you, you do end up being the one who opens the church and, mm -hmm. and locks it in the evening and makes sure the heat is on, and uh, you do a lot of you know diaconal ministry. And um, but they were invaluable years, and uh, it's where my family grew up, and. Uh, um, miss Belfast, miss the, miss the sense of humor that's associated with uh, Belfast. And because these were troubled years. These, right. were, these were years uh, of uh, 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 bombings and, and murders, and, and uh, they were daily occurrences, and uh, uh, the church was not immune to any of that. Uh, so I saw my share of uh, terrorism, and, and America had a different attitude to terrorism then. Uh, lots of support for Irish terrorism from uh, places like Boston, for mm -hmm. example. Uh, and, and now that they're experiencing terrorism of their own, uh, understandably, you know, there, there's a different story. But uh, um, the church was often bewildered by um, by the the retelling of this story across the sea. Right. Right. So, so in the spirit of this elder who said, here are the four or five things you need to know about Robert's rules. What, what would you say if you were going to boil down, now reflecting a number of decades after that, if you were to talk to students, people just entering the ministry, 
What are the things that you would say, focus on these things or remember these things as you serve the Lord? Uh, you know, gospel-focused, um, Christ-centered, uh, God-exalting, spirit-infused, Bible exposition. I mean, all the, the, you know, those mm -hmm. things. Uh, but, but the gospel shape of ministry is, is very important. Um, that you do see the whole, the whole ministry as the, the uh, consequence of what God has done in your life. And I think that, that to me, uh, is, is what keeps me in ministry. Because ministry is, is, is difficult, sometimes unrewarding, sometimes, uh, sometimes you can find yourself in a lot of strife and difficulty, although I've had very little of that, to be honest. Um, but, you know, what keeps you going uh, is um, the shape of gospel ministry. Um, I think that, um, you know, ministry is about sacrifice. And, and I think that uh, we were talking a little earlier about how generations change mm -hmm. in attitudes. I think I serve a generation now that are very concerned about their marriages, much more so, I think, than, than mine was. And, and I think I made sacrifices uh, for, for ministry, putting the church sometimes before my family. Uh, I have a wonderful family and a, and a, and a beautiful, gorgeous wife uh, who has forgiven me a whole lot of uh, things over the years. But I, I, do, I do sense among those that I teach, you know, that they, they are very concerned not to commit the sins of their parents. Uh, and I'm concerned about their marriages. And sometimes, sometimes I want to say, you know, there are times when you're going to have to sacrifice because the body of Christ will need you. Um, I think ministry is more than about, you know, I, I can understand the, the desire to preach and teach. And I, I find a lot of students, you know, having that urge to preach and teach. And there's a there's a kind of power thing about it, mm -hmm. uh, you know, but ministry is relational. Mm -hmm. it's, it's about it's pastoral, and, and you're going to have to get involved in people's lives. Mm -hmm. And uh, after all, you know, even if you're preaching, you're, you're preaching for an hour, mm -hmm. hour and a half, two hours, maybe a week, at most. Uh, but the rest of the time, uh, you know, Robert Murray McShane said, uh, when you walk into the pulpit, you know, people see the shadow that you cast on the wall behind you, uh, and, it, and it's who you are mm -hmm. and what you are. And... Uh, uh, you, you can't really minister effectively if you're stuck in, in, a, in an office in an mm -hmm. ivory tower somewhere. You, and you have to get stuck into people's lives. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I, I tease a friend of mine, you know, that he loves ministry. It's just people he doesn't like. And uh, I don't think there's a Peanuts cartoon, some, something along that. I, you know, I... I uh, uh, I can, I, can, I can identify with it in some ways, because sometimes you just want to close the door. Mm -hmm. and, uh, uh, but, but ministry is, um, is, is relational, and there's a pastoral dimension to it. Um, you know, my, my motivation in ministry, for, and both, both in, in, uh, in pastoral ministry, but also in my, in my academic life as a, as a seminary professor and in my, my doctoral studies, as as you know, um, you know what what do you do a doctorate in? I, mm -hmm. I've, I have students all the time wanting wanting to do PhDs mm -hmm. as though it's just something it's just a box they have to tick, you mm -hmm. know. And uh, and I say to them, why? why why do you want to do it? Because if your motivation in doing it isn't right, then I, I frankly I don't think you should do it, mm -hmm. particularly if you want to minister. Uh, so I, I I deliberately chose a topic that would be of help to me in ministry. Mm -hmm. um, you know, suffering, Book of Job, Calvin. I mean, they, they were all. Uh, I doubt that hardly hardly a week goes by, and I don't I don't think about that mm -hmm. stuff that I mm -hmm. studied and and how it applies in day to day ministry. And uh, um, you know, I tell my students in seminary, I'm really I'm really not interested in in any in teaching stuff that I can't preach. Mm. Now I, I can preach a whole lot of stuff. I can turn a whole lot of academic stuff into, into something that's preachable. 
But there's, there are some things. I'm, I'm, glad, I'm glad people do this stuff. I'm, I just give me the final page and the conclusion. I don't, please don't make me read all of that. But, but um, you know, I'm, I bless God for people who have the patience to do that stuff. But for me, as a, you know, my first calling as a minister, mm -hmm. my first calling is, is the church. Mm -hmm. And I tell the seminary this. I mean, my, mm -hmm. my first calling is the church. And the seminary is there to serve the church. It's not mm -hmm. there to serve itself. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, I, and I think that, um, you know, seeing the value in my discipline of systematic theology, you know, what is the value of systematic theology in ministry, in preaching, uh, on a day-to-day, week-to-week, month-to-month, year-to-year mm -hmm. basis. And um, I, I love talking to students about that. Mm. Well, Dr. Thomas, this has been a pleasure. Thank you once again for joining us. You're welcome. Thank you.